Um, hi everyone, um, welcome to another GIA knowledge sessions. I am Karen Smith, um, I'm going to be your host today. Uh, before we get started, uh, we have a few logistics. Um, so everyone attending is going to be automatically muted. Um, if you do have a question, please feel free to submit it using the Q&A feature. Um, you'll see that at the bottom of your screen. Um, and uh, feel free to ask questions as we go. Um, I'll try to answer some, um, some live, um, but also there'll be a chance um, to have Evan answer a few questions at the end. We will be sending a recording of the session to you later today, um, and that message will also have a survey. And we would love to hear your feedback about the discussion um, and the seminar today. Today, I am joined uh, by my good friend and colleague, Dr. Evan Smith. He's going to be talking to us about cutting and polishing diamonds. He'll talk a bit about the history of polishing and also some of the techniques that we use for polishing our research samples. Evan and I have both spent many hours, days in the lab, cutting and polishing our research samples, and he'll be sharing some of that experience with you today. So with that, I am going to pass it over to you, Evan. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, so maybe about 10 years ago when I was in grad school, I had the task of polishing some pieces of diamond for, for research, for studying the internal structure of the diamond and also for studying inclusions trapped in the diamond. And I remember being really struck by how counterintuitive some of the processes were involved in actually polishing a diamond and I was really fascinated by the process. So today I kind of want to give you a bit of an overview of some of the technology involved in cutting and polishing diamond and what those tools actually look like. And I'm also going to show you some diamonds that I've polished myself. And for full disclosure here, I've never actually cut and polished a faceted beautiful gemstone. I'm polishing things for uh, research purposes. So more like polishing things into a, a slab which is very simplistic, but it still has given me a, a great appreciation for the, the technology at play. So for many, many years uh, since diamond was discovered and started being sort of admired as a beautiful object for you know, over a thousand years, it was appreciated in its you know, natural crystal form. Um, the Romans put it in rings even, and these are some rings from maybe the third or fourth century and you can see they're mounted as this beautiful octahedral crystal. And this was sort of the most coveted form you would get diamond in. And I've called it here diamond the unconquerable because this was sort of it. You either had a crystal of diamond that you admired or if it was something more inferior in quality, it was crushed up and used as a hard material, as a, an abrasive to actually grind other materials or for engraving things uh, like other gemstones or rock crystal because uh, it's so hard it's a great engraving material but the diamond crystals themselves were enjoyed in their their rough state now today we're used to seeing diamonds everywhere in their cut and polished state these beautiful scintillating gemstones and the big revolution that sort of allowed this to be possible was diamond polishing. And this is sort of what a, a modern polishing setup looks like. You've got this in the background, this wheel is it called a scafe. It's made of cast iron or steel and it's embedded with many tiny diamond particles. And then the diamond itself is held in this uh, tang here. Um, Let's see if I have a pointer. Yeah, yeah. So the diamond is held in this tang here and uh, it's sort of held in place. And then this uh, thing you can hold on to, this is what's called the tang. And then this whole thing is held against this polishing wheel here and diamond material is sort of sloughed off and you're left with this beautiful mirror finish uh, facet and this is what people have been using for hundreds of years since the end of the Middle Ages to allow uh, diamonds to be fashioned into these sparkling uh, gemstones. Okay, so this is sort of the, the major steps involved in taking a, a rough uh, diamond through to a, a beautiful faceted diamond here. I, you could break some of these steps up further. Um, I, in fact, might even simplify these a little bit 
uh, by um, calling calling these, uh, these first intermediate steps sort of shaping the rough diamond into something that you're going to actually then polish sort of mirror facets onto. So you start with this rough crystal and then you sort of break it or saw it into some kind of a form and then give it a, an outline like a round outline or a, some other fancy shape by actually shaping the girdle of the diamond. And then the last part of this process is, is where you'd be using the equipment I just showed you in the last slide, actually polishing these mirror finish facets on the diamond. Uh, now, in terms of shaping a diamond from a rough crystal into something else, I would say the most rudimentary technique would be breaking the diamond. And people had been breaking uh, diamonds long before they had been polishing them. And, Often when you break a diamond, it kind of shatters into a, a whole bunch of tiny, tiny fragments. Uh, but if you're very careful, you can actually exploit the diamond crystal structure to shape the diamond into something that you want. You can control the way it breaks. So this is what I would call the most rudimentary method to reshape a diamond in a controlled way. And I think it, this is probably discovered uh, long before it was really used for fashioning gemstones. It wasn't really used extensively in gem manufacturing until the 16th century. But the idea is that diamond cleaves or it breaks apart really perfectly in this 111 plane, which is the uh, octahedral crystal plane. So it's parallel to an octahedral crystal face. And if you look at uh, a diamond here, like on the bottom left, this is a diamond octahedron. And planes that are parallel to these octahedral faces are planes of weakness within the crystal structure and the diamond can be split uh, almost perfectly along these planes. So in the middle here is a octahedral diamond crystal that has been split very cleanly along one of these planes. And this is accomplished uh, sort of on the, on the right here, you can see a diamond and it would have had a little notch or a kerf scratched into it and the idea is that you put this little blade into that little notch and give it a, a little whack with a, a little hammer or mallet and the diamond should propagate from that little notch and, and actually make a crack that goes along this cleavage plane. So the, the kerf and the orientation of the diamond have to be planned out very carefully keeping in mind the diamond crystal structure. Now the idea of cleaving a, a diamond or any mineral is not necessarily intuitive, because this is probably something you don't experience in everyday life. But something that you do experience in everyday life is um, pieces of paper with perforations in them. And this sheet of postage stamps, for instance, has these perforations in them. And you can separate this sheet very easily along these perforations, where you have sort of lines of pre-existing weakness within this sheet. And this is similar to what we have inside minerals that exhibit a cleavage of their crystal structure. So here's uh, calcite, for instance, and we can see the, the atoms that make up uh, calcite. It's carbon, calcium, and oxygen. And if you look at the arrangement of these atoms in this three-dimensional crystal lattice, you can see that there are sort of planes or, or lines through the crystal lattice where there are fewer uh, atoms or, or not as many bonds holding it together. And these are actually planes that extend in three dimensions. And these are pre-existing planes of weakness, just like those perforations in the sheet of stamps. So you can actually break calcite apart really easily along these planes of weakness. So here's a crystal of calcite and it breaks apart along these planes to give you little rhombus shapes. Uh, now a similar thing happens in diamond, but the diamond crystal structure is a different shape. So here's a diamond crystal, and we're looking at an octahedron here. Here's one edge of an octahedron and the other edges. These are all one, one, one octahedral planes, and all of these should be planes of weakness within the diamond along which we can cleave it. So here, this plane on the, on the right, upper right edge, I've shown a dotted uh, red line here, and that's indicating uh, where we should expect to see a plane of weakness that you might be able to see in the diamond crystal structure itself. And if we look at the underlying crystal structure, this is greatly magnified, uh, but this is sort of what it looks like. And you can see that there are, uh, there's sort of a, 
a gap in the crystal structure almost. And this gap repeats um, every layer of atoms. You can see there's another plane of weakness. And this is for one uh, set of 111 planes, but you could also say there's another set of weak planes along this 111 direction. And although we can't see it very well in this orientation, there are two additional 111 sets where we could cleave this diamond. So this is sort of the geometry that's dictated by the diamond crystal lattice. And you can see this nicely on this diamond here. This is the Vargas diamond. This was a large diamond, over 700 carats found in Brazil. And it went to Harry Winston in New York. Uh, and this is, this is a while ago. This is 1938 when it was found. And this diamond was cleaved into pieces before it went on to be cut and polished. It's actually cleaved into 23 pieces. And you can see it's sort of been inked out here, drawings on the, the surface of the crystal. And these are the traces of those octahedral planes along which it's planned to cleave this diamond. A more modern example of cleaving to sort of shape a rough diamond is this diamond here which I had the pleasure of seeing myself in its rough state. Uh, on the left here, it actually was featured on the cover of Science Magazine in 2016, which is the same year that this diamond was actually found in Angola. It's a 404 carat diamond. And in this image on the left, you can see a faint line here that's uh, pointed out with these red arrows. And this is a 111 plane of mechanical twinning. So the diamond is actually been slightly deformed here, and there's a little bit of a plane running through the diamond crystal where the, the crystal lattice has shifted sort of one way and shifted back along this twin plane. And if you were to try to polish this whole diamond, um, you would end up probably with a little bit of a step over that little twin plane. So this is uh, not something that you necessarily want to incorporate into the diamond, and it's best to divide the diamond along that uh, region. And fortunately, because it's a 111 plane, this is also a plane that can be cleaved. And that's exactly what they did. This small image in the, the upper uh, portion of the slide, they're actually scratching a kerf, a little notch, to start this cleave into that diamond. And then on the bottom uh, here in my hand, you can see where they actually cleaved right along that same very line. and that. Uh, piece that they cleaved off is just sitting at the bottom here. Now back to our little uh, flow chart here that's sort of simplified. Uh, we want to talk now about the other major method of, of sort of shaping a rough diamond into something that might go on to be brooded and faceted, and that is sawing. So sawing is a, a method that came about a little bit later than um, the actual polishing method, which was uh, sort of adopted in the Middle Ages. Uh, polishing sort of was established for a while before people started sawing diamonds regularly. But this was described in some detail in a book by DeLay in 1647. And the technique of sawing diamonds was described as having a, a thin wire in sort of a bow saw uh, and this is a modern saw I just found on Lee Valley Tools, but uh, the diamond saw would have been similar to this where you have a, a frame holding a wire and this little wire is anointed with oil and diamond powder to give it some grit. And the idea is that you would just sit there and saw the diamond. This would have taken a long, long time. But the advantage is that this sawing technique can let you divide a diamond along cubic planes, the one, one, or one, zero, zero planes, as well as dodecahedral planes, one, one, zero planes. So it gives you some more freedom as to how you might actually divide up a large piece of rough. Remember, if you're trying to cleave a diamond, you're restricted to the cleavage plane, which is the one, one, one plane. So, having the ability to cleave or saw gives you a lot more freedom in terms of how you're going to divide up a rough diamond. And it's like we said, this would have been very, very labor intensive, uh, but it was used well into the 19th century. And around that time, um, this device was invented. This is the motorized diamond saw, where instead of having a uh, wire 
that's sort of embedded with diamond powder. Now you've got a disc rotating continuously driven by a belt or now maybe even directly driven by a motor, but this rotating disc uh, really saves you the, the manual labor of having to sit there with the wire and, and saw away the diamond. So this uh, disc is made of copper or phosphor bronze and it has little tiny diamond particles in it. And again, you can saw the diamond within two predominant directions uh, shown here on the left, either the cube plane, which is also known as the four point or sawing plane. And the image on the right that shows an octahedral diamond crystal being sawed along this cube plane. Uh, you can also saw diamonds on the two point plane, which is actually a, a one, one, zero or dodecahedral plane. And if you try to deviate from these planes, it really doesn't work very well. And the saw ends up being destroyed before you can really saw anything in any kind of a, a, a plane into the diamond. So you're kind of restricted to these uh, crystallographic orientations. Again, you have to work with the underlying framework of the diamond crystal itself. So sawing uh, was actually used for this diamond here, the star of Sierra Leone, which was discovered in Sierra Leone in 1972. And again, uh, we're talking about Harry Winston here. This is where the diamond went. And they used a combination of mechanical sawing. So again, we see one of these uh, bronze discs with diamond embedded in it to saw the, the star of Sierra Leone. But this diamond was also partially cleaved to, to break it up into smaller uh, fragments that would have been cut and polished. So both of these techniques were, were used for the star of Sierra Leone. And later in the 1970s, uh, there was the advent of laser cutting. And laser cutting has come a long way now and is, is being used more and more. It has a number of advantages. It's much, much faster and it's a little bit easier to control, but the, the, uh, the advantage is that you can not only cut planes into the diamond, you can do a lot of things to shape diamond using lasers. So this is sort of the, the early laser technology where you would have a laser being focused onto the diamond. And the, I think one of the things that happened here, in addition to the invention of lasers was good computer control to allow the, the diamond to be moved back and forth so that the, the laser can actually cut out a pattern. And the diamond is sort of cut into a, a, a wedge is almost cut out of the diamond. Uh, and this diamond being cut here would end up having sort of a, a wedge shape cut through it here. And the reason it has to be cut into this sort of wedge shape is because the laser has to be focused down to a point. Uh, so in, it, in order to be able to focus the laser down to a point when you're getting towards the end of this cut, you need to have space at, at the upper end where you started this cut for the light to be sort of converged into a point where it's actually ablating the, the diamond material. So we can look at this sort of focusing of the laser here. Uh, so here you can imagine the the laser coming in, being focused through a lens, and at some distance away from the lens, it's focused to a small point. And that's where we want the uh, diamond to be that you're actually cutting away. So there's a, a, a strong uh, dependence on the, the distance of the diamond from this lens that's condensing it. And this is a bit of a limitation to the technique because you have to be very careful about how far away the diamond is. Uh, and a more recent development in this uh, technology of laser cutting is this, which is a, a water jet uh, kind of, of laser. So here the laser is condensed, but then the laser is actually fed into a water jet. And the water jet behaves almost like a fiber optic cable. So rather than having to worry about focusing the laser to a point, the laser is already contained within this narrow little jet of water. And the jet can be the, the width of a human hair. So it's very, very fine. Uh, and this is kind of an interesting thing to me, just to imagine this laser bouncing around inside this column of water and it's trapped until it, it reaches the surface of the diamond and then is uh, ablating the diamond material. And Here's some nice images of this kind of a, a water jet guided uh, laser being used to cut the Constellation diamond, which was the, the most expensive rough diamond 
ever sold at auction. It was $63 million. And here it is being uh, cut apart by a laser. So this is the first cut they made into this diamond. And you can see the cut surface here is very sharp, well controlled. And you can see this beam uh, on the, the left hand side is very, very narrow and tightly focused. So you have to worry a, a little bit less about the distance between the diamond and the laser and controlling that. So you, you end up with sort of a, a bit more flexibility. Now not shown here, but you can do a lot more fancy things with a laser than just cut a plane through a diamond. You can actually cut uh, curved surfaces sometimes or, or cut a wedge, which is called pie cutting, to cut uh, you know, a pie-shaped wedge out of a diamond. So there's a lot of freedom uh, that's allowed through using laser cutting to sort of shape some of these rough diamonds. And this even extends into um, beyond just sawing, traditional sawing, but actually shaping diamonds and sort of eliminating uh, some of the traditional grinding methods of brooding to give diamond its shape. You can actually do a lot of this just by laser cutting. So here's a, just an image I took from a catalog advertising this uh, laser cutting system, but it has some images showing how you might shape a rough diamond into something that's almost ready to just be faceted uh, right away. It's actually done a lot of the work that might have taken several steps before. So the laser cutting is a really powerful uh, technique and it's actually been used even for more uh, adventurous endeavors like uh, carving diamonds. Now these diamonds here have been carved using laser cutting but also a number of other more proprietary techniques that are kind of a secret to the carver uh, but I just wanted to show that it's possible uh, now to to really make some incredible three-dimensional shapes uh, out of diamond using some modern technology. So back to our flow chart here uh, we went from the, the rough diamond and you can either cleave it or saw it to make it into a shape. The next step uh, in this flow sheet here is brooding or sort of giving the diamond its outline of the girdle. And this has traditionally been done by uh, brooding. So grinding sort of the outline of the diamond girdle, usually by turning a diamond on a lathe and even turning it against another diamond. So the two diamonds sort of butt up against one another and grind one another away until you have a round outline of the, the girdle. And you can have two diamonds grinding up against one another, but you can also have uh, a, a diamond being brooded by sort of a, a diamond workpiece that's um, embedded with diamond fragments. And this works not only for uh, a round uh, brooding where you would be making a, a round brilliant diamond, you can also have diamonds being turned a little bit more off axis or uh, computer controlled brooding that allows you to fashion the outline of the diamond into a fancy shape like a, a cushion or a marquise or a, a square, something like that. Uh, one of the interesting things about brooding here is that it actually produces diamond dust. And diamond dust, of course, is something that you need for uh, sawing diamonds and for polishing diamonds. So for as long as people have been brooding diamonds, they've been collecting that dust because it's a valuable uh, input for some of these other means to process diamonds into these beautiful faceted gemstones. So now I want to move on to polishing. And this is really the, the part that, that has allowed diamonds to be um, enjoyed in this uh, sparkly form that we we know and love them in. And this is the the thing that really took me by surprise 10 years ago when I was tasked with polishing diamonds. So people have been polishing diamonds since the end of the Middle Ages. The exact origins are not really well documented, probably because a lot of these things are sort of trade secrets. If you're the one to figure out how to polish diamonds and you're the only one on the block who knows how, you've got a huge advantage and you're not gonna share your secrets, secrets very widely. Uh, but we, we can say pretty confidently that by the time the 13th century rolled around, there was polishing happening in India. And there seem even early examples of, of jewelry, perhaps from the late 12th century that looked like uh, 
diamonds might have been beginning to be polished by certain um, artisans. Uh, but polishing technology uh, was transported from, from India and, and uh, all the way to Europe, uh, probably by 1330, uh, transported by merchants who were trading diamonds. And it looks like um, by the 1300s, people were polishing diamonds in Venice, and then it became more widespread. But it wasn't until um, 1568, so we have this uh, diamond polishing technique being documented in detail by a goldsmith and sculptor named Cellini in Florence. So the first really good detailed description we have of the methods being used is in 1568. And this uh, engraved plate on the, on the right here, this is depicting uh, what's actually described by Cellini. So this is a depiction of 16th century polishing here. And what's interesting is that a lot of what they're doing in this picture is pretty similar and recognizable to uh, the same polishing methods used today. So in this picture, you can see uh, here outlined in blue, this is a polishing scape rotating very quickly. And it's set on this uh, in red here, this outlined quill. And this is being driven by a belt that's attached to this big wheel out here. And the wheel is driven by hand. And this uh, scape is rotating very, very quickly, probably two or 3,000 RPM, just like it is today. And this uh, person at the left here is holding on to uh, a tang that's holding a diamond, uh, probably right here. So a lot of what they're doing in this picture is recognizable and comparable to what we're doing today. Now, if we look at, again, what we're doing today, this is me trying to polish a diamond, and we've got the same sort of rotating scape. It's a cast iron embedded with diamond particles, and the diamond is being held in a, a dop and tang, and it's being uh, sort of held up against this rotating scape and polished. So the mechanisms are essentially unchanged here. Now, the diamond actually being held in the tang um, is sort of either held by a cement or a solder or a wax as it is on the left side here, or it can be held in place mechanically with some kind of jaw mechanism um, that, that is holding on to the diamond here. And in both of these cases, it's important that the diamond can be manipulated and adjusted in its orientation because the orientation of the diamond is extremely important, not only for the facet that you want to polish, and the orientation of that in the diamond, but also the orientation of the diamond with respect to the scape. And we'll see why that's important in a moment. So um, a lot of that is unchanged and we do this by hand still, but in the 1970s, around the same sort of time when laser cutting became a thing, um, some of this computer control and ability to manipulate uh, a diamond very well allowed people to develop automatic polishing machines. These two examples here are from the 90s uh, and things have become even more advanced since then. But these machines here are capable of actually finding the grain or the polishing direction. Um, the diamond needs to be rotated to find the soft polishing direction. And if it's not in that soft polishing direction, you're essentially wasting your time and the diamond really isn't can be polished very well and the scape can actually be damaged. So these uh, instruments here can actually find that soft polishing direction. And we'll see uh, a little bit better depiction in the next coming slides here. But first, let's just talk about polishing in general. Uh, this is what I found a little bit counterintuitive about polishing diamonds. So I'm sort of familiar, as I'm sure a lot of you are, the idea of polishing some material, for instance, this slab of meteorite on the left. This is a palisite meteorite. It's made up of iron nickel alloy and it has these beautiful uh, green, yellow olivines uh, set within it. Or this topaz on the right here, which has been polished into this beautiful gemstone here. And in both of these cases, the idea with polishing is that you've got uh, some kind of a workpiece like your meteorite or your topaz, 
and you're rubbing it up against some kind of hard abrasive material like a, an iron file or some kind of a, a ceramic abrasive like a bonded alumina disc or something like that and the workpiece is scratched or physically uh, broken up and worn away and you have these little particles of that material that are broken off and uh, sort of washed away and this would be known as two body wear so you've got two bodies involved you've got the, the abrasive material and you've got the workplace the other kind of polishing by abrasion involves three body wear so here you've got three things to worry about you've got a substrate that might be something soft like a cloth or a, a metal disc that's not very hard and then sort of with on with that um, substrate you would use a, a polishing paste or a slurry that has all these tiny hard abrasive particles in it and these are doing the work of wearing away the workpiece and the same you have this abrasive action where the workpiece um, the the iron meteorite or whatever is being sort of scratched away and you have little pieces of that material sloughing off and the workpiece becomes smoother and you might grade from coarse particles or a coarse uh, substrate to to something finer and finer and the scratches in your workpiece become smaller and smaller and eventually the the workpiece has this beautiful mirror finish in it so this is what i had in the back of my mind when i was thinking about diamond polishing and how it would work that you would be abrading away little tiny particles of diamond uh, but diamond is the the hardest natural material here uh, on the this diagram on the left here, we've got the Mohs hardness scale where we've got different minerals uh, ranked in order and diamond is number 10. It's harder than the next hardest thing, which is corundum, which is a number nine. Uh, but if you plot this on a different kind of scale that's not just uh, relative by integers and you actually give it a, a value, for instance, this is an indentation hardness, Vickers hardness, there's also new hardness, and you would see something, something similar here where the diamond is not just one number harder, it, it's way harder, it's several times harder than corundum. So if it's so hard, what is the hard particle that you use to abrade the diamond? This is kind of something that stumped me, and I'm sure a lot of you are shouting out the answer right now. What is to use to polish diamond? Well, we use diamond particles to polish diamond. Uh, so this rotating scape is embedded with all these little tiny uh, particles of diamond grit. And the picture you might have in your head uh, would involve, you know, diamond sort of scratching the, the diamond that you're polishing and you end up with these polishing lines which seem to confirm that idea that the diamond is being scratched away and you have these little lines in the polished facet that that are evidence of that but in detail it doesn't quite work when you look at these polishing lines left over on a facet when you look at them very closely uh, they're actually much much smaller than the size of the grit particles so here, the, the topography of these polishing lines has been vertically exaggerated. So this is a little block that's 500 nanometers by 500 nanometers, and the vertical scale is exaggerated. So the polished surface isn't quite this wavy, but this is, this is sort of blown up to give you a better appreciation of the polishing lines. But I want you to see that there are many, many lines here within this block that's only 500 nanometers wide. Whereas the grit particles we're using to polish this diamond are larger than this. They're much larger than one micron. So there's no way that these are scratches from those grit particles. There's something more complicated happening here. And when we look at the diamond surface that we're polishing, so here we've got the cast iron scaife on the left, the lower piece on the left, this cast iron substrate is embedded with diamond grit particles and we're polishing this diamond workpiece. And you might expect that we would be breaking off or scratching off little pieces of diamond uh, onto that scape that would be left over. And we would have some kind of diamond dust being worn away from the diamond. But that's not actually what happens. You don't have diamond dust being worn away. Instead, what you see being deposited on the scape is 
just carbon that's not diamond anymore. It's actually gone through a phase transition. So the material being worn away is not actually diamond. It's uh, carbon that's sp2 bonded. So it's almost like graphite or even amorphous carbon. It's no longer diamond. So this is just going to show that this is a, a more complicated process than you might intuitively think it is. And in fact, this is still an active area of research. People are still trying to understand exactly what the wear mechanism is that's allowing diamond to be polished. And, you know, this is an important uh, aspect, for, I mean, out, just out of interest, so we can understand how diamond gemstones are polished, but it's also really important for technological applications. If you're trying to polish diamond uh, windows for a laser or some other optical device or diamond lenses or polishing uh, diamonds, for instance, for a timepiece, like you might want to use diamond because it's so hard and resistant to wear. You might want to use diamond in a watch, for instance. And for all of these applications, you need to be able to polish really excellent surfaces on diamond. So that's why diamond polishing is such a, uh, continues to be an active area of research. And it's just interesting that uh, we don't fully understand the process here. Now, as we said, this diamond scafe is rotating very quickly, typically uh, 2,400 to 3,000 revolutions per minute. And this scafe is either impregnated with diamond dust that's rubbed into the scafe with oil, or the, the diamond scafe might be sort of bonded with, um, electrochemically bonded with diamond powder at a factory. And then when it wears out, you would change the scafe and send the worn one out to be recoated with diamond dust. Again, the, the diamond is held in a dop and tang. Uh, it can become kind of hot and you wanna be able to hold the diamond securely and be able to maneuver it and reposition it very accurately without actually burning your fingers or anything like that. Uh, but one of the things that really surprised me when it came time for me to try polishing diamonds is that the, the direction of polishing is critical uh, because diamond has hard directions and it has soft directions. It has a grain to it, almost the way wood has grain. If you're cutting a piece of wood, it makes a huge difference if you're cutting with the wood grain or against the wood grain. It's much harder to cut it if you're cutting against the grain. And that analogy and that terminology is sort of what's brought over into diamond polishing, the idea of cutting with the grain or against the grain. This diamond being held in a, in a, dop, a jaw like dop here on the right uh, can be sort of rotated around this vertical axis to help the polisher find the optimal direction, find that soft direction to polish this facet in. This is a, a very important part of uh, polishing well and brings us to this idea of wear anisotropy or, or the grain within the diamond. So this is a diamond crystal here and the facets shown here are crystal facets. So these are like uh, crystallographic directions within the diamond and all of our, our you know, Friends are here that we talked about before. We've got the 100 surface, the cubic surface within the diamond crystal, the 110 surface, the dodecahedral plane, and these tiny triangles here, those are the 111 or the octahedral crystal planes. And these arrows shown here are depicting uh, sort of the relative ease with which diamond can be polished in any given direction. And you'll notice that it's different for all these different orientations, these different facet orientations, and within each facet, the direction in which you're trying to polish uh, really matters to how quickly the diamond can be worn away. So for instance, if we, we take a, a closer look at this dodecahedral or 110 surface, and we're gonna to try to polish a facet in that orientation, this is what it might look like. So here we've got the, the diamond in our tang and we can rotate it about this axis to help us find the, the soft grain, the soft polishing direction. And this is what that facet might look like. So here we're seeing the facet being pushed right up against the, the scafe here. 
And in this uh, upper left example here, in, in the middle of the screen, the, the diamond uh, facet is being held against the, the rotating scafe and the green arrows show the direction of the, the scafe. These diamond grit particles are being dragged across the sign for this diamond surface and they're going with these little tiny arrows. This is a hard direction and if you tried to polish this facet in this direction, it wouldn't work very well. The diamond uh, wouldn't get a very nice polish to it and the wear rate would be extremely slow and it would actually be damaging the surface of the scafe and kind of disrupting uh, all the little grit particles and perhaps even gouging the surface of the scafe. If you rotate that diamond uh, a little bit, uh, you might find that you're starting to polish a little bit better. And if you rotate it into this direction here where these uh, long arrows within that facet are aligned with these green arrows, now that facet is in a soft polishing direction. And you can actually hear the difference, you can feel the difference, and the, the actual friction between the facet and the scafe increases and the wear rate goes up immediately. And so the diamond starts polishing really well when you've got it oriented in one of these soft directions. Now, if we look at some of the other uh, sort of facet directions in this little uh, cartoon crystal here, we can see uh, what it looks like if you were to rotate those facets around, um, around this sort of red axis here. If you're rotating the diamond to see where that soft uh, direction is, we can actually see that in this graph here. So uh, first let's look at that dodeca dodecahedral uh, facet we were just looking at it. It has this um, big long black arrow showing a soft direction. It actually has two very soft directions. In this graph on the left here, we can see that corresponds with uh, two peaks where on the, on the right axis, this is the wear rate. So how quickly the diamond is being worn away. And as you rotate the diamond around that red axis in the tang, you would find a big spike in one direction and the wear rate would increase significantly and you have a very soft polishing direction. And if you continued to rotate the diamond, just even a few degrees, the polishing would drop off. And then once you rotate it a full 180 degrees, then you find another soft polishing direction and the rate of polishing goes way back up. And you find something similar, but with different symmetry in these different crystal orientations. So if we look at, for instance, the cube plane. So it has four different good polishing directions here. And as we try to polish that face on the diamond and rotate it around, its, uh, it, around that axis we showed in the last slide, we would find four peaks where we have really good polishing and then you rotate the diamond slightly and then the polishing rate drops off and we find ourselves in a hard direction again. And then you continue to rotate the diamond and it picks up again. You find yourself in a soft polishing direction again. And if we look at the octahedral face, this is actually one that has very, very low polishing rates. And typically uh, people avoid trying to polish on a one, one, one or octahedral face because the rate of polishing is very, very low and the quality of polishing is very, very poor. Uh, but it does have some slight ability to polish and it does have uh, three reasonable polishing directions. But in general, uh, people try to avoid polishing on this specific orientation. And you might try to reorient the facet a little bit to improve the, the polishing rate and the quality of that polished surface. Now, the, the sort of reason for this amazing directional hardness within the diamond has to do again with the underlying crystal lattice. The, the way the geometry of the sort of molecular bonds in the crystal lattice have a huge effect on the way it polishes. And if you look at these three different uh, facets that we showed here, the, the dodecahedral facet, the, the cubic facet, and the octahedral facet, the underlying crystal structure looks very different in each case. And that's the sort of the reason why they behave so differently and why they have this different symmetry to them. 
Now here, what we're showing is the speed of the scape. So we talked about it rotating at a speed of around 3000 RPM. And if you had a, a scape that was about 30 centimeters in diameter, the outer edge of that would be rotating at about a linear velocity of 30 meters a second. So if you just looked at the edge of the scape, you would see 30 meters worth of material go by every second. And if you speed up the revolutionary speed of the scape, you would see a higher linear velocity. And if you slowed it down, you would see a lower linear velocity. And what this graph is showing you is that the rate of material being worn away is strongly dependent on that rotational velocity. So most uh, diamond scapes for polishing are rotating at around 3000 RPM. And there's a good reason for that because that's sort of a, a sweet spot where you have reasonable polishing uh, where you might be up here at around six or eight microns, micrometers of material being polished away every minute. And if you go to a higher speed, well, you might get slightly higher rates of wear, but you would also get more heating of the diamond. And more importantly, the scape itself begins to warm up and the diamond grit particles can move, migrate, become dislodged, and they become less effective. So at higher speeds, that wear rate actually starts to taper off. And if we look at the other end of this graph, uh, towards the lower speeds, you'll notice that this uh, red line, this trend doesn't actually intersect the origin of this graph. So it doesn't go to zero, zero. If you slow down the scape speed below some threshold, the polishing really stops. Um, and it, it doesn't sort of trend right down into a, a wear rate of zero, which suggests that there is some kind of a minimum speed. You have to be up to a certain speed, almost like a, in Back to the Future, you have to be you know, fast enough in the DeLorean to hit that sweet spot where you can actually uh, travel through time. So here you have to be rotating the scape at a fast enough speed before you have enough of this activation energy to activate the process that's polishing diamonds. And again, we don't fully understand what that mechanism is, but it's strongly dependent on the rotational speed of the scape. Another thing that factors or that factors heavily on the polishing rate is how much pressure is being put on that diamond that's being polished. So in this graph, again on the bottom, we've got sort of the speed of the scape rotating and we've got wear rate vertically again. Uh, but now we've got four different lines here showing harder and harder um, sort of pressure being put on that diamond. And Polishers sometimes will weigh the diamond down with a little sandbag to increase the pressure that is exerted against the diamond. Um, now this results in higher wear rates. You can polish more material more quickly, but you also have more heating. So if you push really hard on the diamond to make it uh, polish more quickly, you end up with more heat. And you can have so much heat that the diamond becomes red hot, which is really undesirable because the diamond can uh, crack in those instances and, and the polishing quality is not very good. Uh, you can also do things to reduce the pressure that's being put on the diamond. And that's what's shown here. So in this, uh, this polishing bench here, there's a uh, person that's got up and, and left, but I've taken a picture of uh, where they were working. And you can see indicated by this red arrow here, there's a little weight hanging off the edge of this tang that's actually leveraging the tang a little bit and relieving some of the pressure that's being put on the diamond. And the reason why is that this person is polishing a green diamond. And when you're polishing green diamonds, you really don't want them to heat up. So it's important to polish them very carefully and manage that pressure that's being put on the diamond. Because if the diamond heats up, above you know, four or 500 degrees Celsius, the color begins to diminish and it can actually turn brown. So polishing green diamonds is really a, a kind of a, a scary endeavor, I think, but requires a great deal of skill. Now, if we look closer at this uh, rotating scape, uh, so this uh, rotating scape, this 
a cast iron thing in the middle that's whizzing around at 3000 RPM. If we look at it under the microscope, here in the upper left image, we can see some of these diamond grit particles that are embedded within that cast iron scape. And there's sort of a cluster of them that have all nestled into a little groove in the cast iron scape. And these particles are, you know, something like five or 10 or 20 microns and different size grit particles are used depending on whether um, they're trying to polish away a lot of material or polish it to a very fine uh, mirror-like finish that's as perfectly smooth as possible. Uh, but if we look closer at those diamond grit particles in the bottom left image here, so now we can see some of these individual particles, they're actually flat topped. So they're not like pointy little spikes gouging at the diamond, they're actually flat and they're rubbing up against the, the diamond facet that's being polished, which is also flat. So you've sort of got flat particles against a flat workpiece. And this again comes back to this idea that the diamond polishing isn't really like gouging away or scratching away diamond material. On the upper left here, you can see one individual diamond grit particle, and you can see that it's been dragged through the scape. And this is a really interesting that hap thing that happens when you're polishing. These diamond grit particles will move they'll migrate and they'll actually turn and reorient themselves so the diamond particles themselves are in soft polishing directions because the diamond grit particles uh, also have the same anisotropy to them as the diamond that you're trying to polish and if you look at one of these grit particles very closely so the bottom right image here this is zoomed right in on one grit particle within the scape and you can actually see polishing lines on this grit particle on the scape. So you have polishing lines, not only on the, the diamond that you're polishing, but also on the diamond particles on the scape itself. So there's actually sort of a reciprocal polishing effect here. And, and again, I, I just find this fascinating that uh, it, it's, it, it's actually a phase transition and you're not actually scratching away particles of diamond, but the diamond that's being polished away is now some kind of amorphous or sp2 bonded carbon that just gets deposited as a black layer on the scape itself. One final thing I want to mention about this uh, sort of phenomenon of diamond polishing is that as this material is being worn away from the diamond being polished, sometimes the diamond will light up uh, an effect called triboluminescence. And this is not fully understood, but it might have something to do with uh, the creation of an electric field here. And it's been proposed that this diamond is almost behaving like a light emitting diode, that the diamond right at the surface is almost like a semiconductor lighting up in the presence of an electric field. Uh, and this is a picture that I took when I observed this phenomenon for the first time, I was really blown away. The diamond started glowing this blue color and I was kind of disappointed when I looked online, I Googled it and found out that actually other people have noticed this too, and I'm not the first, but it just goes to show that something really uh, interesting is happening at that interface where you're polishing diamond away. And now in the last few slides, I want to talk about polishing diamonds for research. This is polishing that I've done. So not for making uh, gemstones that will be set in jewelry, but for exposing uh, the interior of a diamond or exposing an, an inclusion in a diamond. So this is um, three pieces of diamond that are set in epoxy inside a one inch round disc. And this uh, uh, sort of whole thing has been coated with carbon to give it a conductive layer. But I like how uh, how beautifully polished this uh, surface is. It almost looks like a mirror finish. And one of the reasons why we might want to sort of expose a nice cross section with a beautiful mirror finish through a diamond, one of the reasons is uh, to look at the internal structure of the diamond. So these are a few images of diamonds that have been polished through their middle. And you can see the growth structure, and this is revealed here in CL or cathode luminescence imaging. So the diamond is actually being bombarded with a beam of electrons and is giving off light. And you can see a contrast of dark and light that probably corresponds to the, 
variations in nitrogen concentration in the diamond and it actually reveals some growth structures and these diamonds can actually have rings or episodes of diamond growth that kind of look like tree rings and you can see how the diamond has grown from the middle towards towards the edge and in some cases the the growth is very messy and chaotic looking and in some cases the the diamond growth is very uh, regular and structured and ordered looking and people can even go further than this and analyze uh, for instance the carbon isotopes within each of those layers or the nitrogen concentration or the nitrogen isotopes and get an idea of how the diamond has changed with each successive growth layer. Uh, you can also sometimes see zonation like this, uh, even in transmitted light. So these are three images of sort of polished slices of diamonds, slices through the middle. And you can see just with plain transmitted light, variations in the color of the diamond that correspond to growth layers. And in these cases, uh, you can see uh, consecutive layers numbered one, two, three, four, five. Um, and in these cases, you can uh, do CL imaging, or you could even shine uh, infrared light through these slices and examine how the infrared absorption spectrum changes from the middle and through all these different growth layers. So it, it's, it's interesting to polish a cross section through a diamond and see how it varies from the core to the rim. It's also um, polishing is a great technique for exposing or examining inclusions in more detail. And this is probably most of what I've done my polishing for. So here are a few examples of inclusions or other minerals that have been trapped inside the diamond during diamond growth. Here's a, a couple of garnets and an example of a green uh, peridotitic clinopyroxene. And these inclusions, just to sort of recap how inclusions happen, um, here's a, a diamond growing maybe 200 kilometers deep in the earth. And as this diamond grows bigger and bigger, sometimes it can envelop one of these surrounding mineral grains and trap it inside the diamond. And when this diamond later, if we're lucky, is transported up to surface, then we have a diamond with a little snapshot in it, this little mineral grain that's trapped from 200 kilometers down below our feet, perhaps a billion years or three billion years ago. And it's a really uh, well-preserved snapshot of something that's happening a long time ago in this part of the earth that we can't access in any other way. So inclusions in diamond are a really valuable source of information for earth scientists like myself. And Here's an example of a, a diamond that had some inclusions in it, and I polished this facet. I actually polished it down a little bit farther so that we could expose this inclusion here and examine it more closely um, using electron microprobe to actually understand what the composition of this inclusion is. Uh, here's another diamond, and I've polished a, a facet into this. And again, you'll see that this isn't really like for gem purposes. This is just a diamond that's been polished down to expose these inclusions. And in the right hand side here, you can see uh, one of these inclusions that's been exposed uh, for me to examine it. It's a metallic inclusion that's made up of iron, nickel, and sulfur, as well as carbon. And uh, in this particular diamond, after I examined this inclusion here, I actually polished down to one of these other inclusions. So this is an image showing the same diamond, but now circled in red, we're sort of focusing the microscope a little bit deeper into the diamond and looking at another inclusion. So this diamond I've actually polished several times and looked at uh, consecutive slices through the diamond to examine many of its inclusions. Now, here's another example of some inclusions that I didn't actually want to expose, but that I wanted to get a nice uh, window in the diamond to actually examine the diamond without breaking into it so that it's still preserved, fully intact within the diamond, but that you can see it really well and actually analyze it using Raman spectroscopy. So these diamonds here are uh, slices that have been polished and you can see into them really well with a microscope. And in these particular diamonds, what you can see inside 
are these. These are actually fluid inclusions. And the reason why you don't want to polish into them is if you actually polished too deep and breached one of these inclusions, the material would just sort of seep out and there would be nothing left. And what's actually trapped in these inclusions is a mixture of liquid nitrogen and CO2. And it's not actually that cold like you would expect for liquid nitrogen. Uh, these are under tremendous pressure and the pressure is what's keeping the, the nitrogen and the CO2 in a, in a liquid or fluid state as opposed to a, you know, this gas that's just gonna uh, spew out everywhere. So these are just some snapshots of diamonds that I've polished and seen in my research. But I hope this has given you a bit of an overview of some of the, the tools used to cut and polish diamonds and how they've uh, come to be and, and what they look like. And, and maybe you can appreciate them as really the fascinating uh, pieces of technology that they are. So we saw cleaving where we can break a diamond along these weak planes in the crystal lattice. There's also sawing a diamond where you can cut it along a cube plane or a dodecahedral plane, uh, which evolved from using a, a wire and a bow saw to this motorized rotating copper or bronze disc. And then finally laser cutting where you're sort of slicing through the diamond, which is really exciting with a, a laser. Uh, and then the technique after that to sort of give the, the girdle shape, the outline of the diamond would be called bruting. And that evolved from sort of a, a mechanical grinding of the diamond or traditional bruting of rubbing one diamond up against another, but now is increasingly being replaced by sort of laser cutting to give that outline of the diamond. And then my favorite is diamond polishing as we spend some time examining some of the mysterious uh, ways it actually works at the molecular scale. But diamond polishing we have uh, being recorded since at least as early as the 13th century. And the polishing technology, this idea of a rotating scaphe embedded with diamond particles, that technology is largely unchanged today. And exactly how it works is still an active area of study. And the last part I showed you here is that uh, polishing diamonds is actually critical for scientific uh, research of diamonds to understand how diamonds grow, but also to understand the earth and the earth's interior deep beneath our feet, because diamonds are really the only way that we can examine well-preserved samples from hundreds of kilometers deep beneath our feet. Without polishing, we wouldn't be able to have the same control in examining the material trapped in those diamonds. So now I think is a good time to take any questions that you might have. Great, thank you so much, Aaron. That was a very insightful talk, very detailed. Um, so we do have quite a few questions. Um, so the one that um, sort of came up a few times uh, was just trying to understand the nomenclature of the 111, 110, 101 planes. So we had the octahedral, the dodec, and the cubic crystallographic planes. Um, if you could just clarify again, which one is the hardest direction to polish, which one is the softest direction to polish. Um, if you could also clarify for us why they were named 111, 110, 101. Um, and then lastly, in, with, the, with the polishing directions is, if you do see visible polishing lines on the diamond surface, does that indicate that the diamond was polished in a suboptimal sort of direction? Okay, uh, well, let's start with the last one. That's relatively easy. The polishing lines uh, are actually indicative of the direction of diamond polishing. So if you see polishing lines, it means the diamond was being polished and that's not necessarily indicative that the polishing direction was poor. It's indicative that the diamond was being polished. And when people are polishing diamonds, they're constantly checking to see the orientation of the polishing lines because the polishing lines will tell you uh, which direction to, to rotate the diamond into and align those polishing lines with the rotating direction of the scaphe because you want those diamond grit particles on the scaphe to be sort of, uh, sort of skating past the diamond in the same orientation as those polishing lines to continue polishing on that facet. Uh, now back to those other questions. So um, 
yeah. So we, we were talking about three different sort of sets of, of uh, crystallographic planes within the diamond. And we'll start with the one, one, one. So that's the octahedral crystal plane. And these numbers that we give them, the one, 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 this refers to crystallographic, um, sort of like a three-dimensional space and how you would actually describe the orientation of one of these planes in like a mathematical sense. So the 111, that number is called a Miller index. And the same goes for the 100 and the 110. Uh, these are all Miller indices to try to mathematically describe the orientation of that plane within three-dimensional space in reference to the crystal lattice underneath it. Um, so you've got the 111, that's the octahedral plane, and that's very, very difficult to polish. And there are three almost sort of soft directions within that, but really even the soft directions are not very, not very uh, soft. The, the 111 plane is very difficult to polish on. Uh, and then I also talked about the 100, the cubic plane, so those, um, those have four good polishing directions within them. And then you have the dodecahedral plane. The dodecahedral plane is the 110 plane, and that has two really good polishing directions. And those are the, the softest directions you'll find in the diamond where you can polish um, the most material quickly. So, those dodecahedral planes are really where it's at if you're polishing diamonds. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so next up is about the lasers that are used to laser cut the diamonds. Uh, so the one question was what type of laser um, is used to cut because we know, you know, there's a range of lasers that can be used for various applications. So what type of laser is used for laser cutting? Um, and the next question with the laser cutting is why exactly the surface of the diamond becomes black. I'm assuming that is sort of just because you're overstepping the temperature and so you're converting diamond into its low pressure form, right? Yeah, yeah, so the, the kind of laser that's most commonly used would be a, a green laser that is a, a solid state laser uh, that's got uh, neodymium in it. So a neodymium YAG laser is the most common uh, kind of laser that's used and that would be a frequency doubled laser. So the the actual laser wavelength that you see coming out of the cutter is green at uh, 532 nanometers. Um, and it's a, usually a very, very powerful laser. So tens of watts, which is much, much stronger than the, the kind of laser that you would be using for Raman spectroscopy, which is uh, milliwatts, you know. So it's a very, very intense uh, laser and the black color that you see is essentially what you said. It's, it's diamond that uh, is no longer diamond. So now it's carbon that's not in the, the diamond crystal structure anymore. It's reverted either to graphite or to amorphous uh, carbon. So it's almost like soot, uh, but it's adhered very strongly to the diamond itself. And in most cases, it has to be polished away but not all laser cutters result in that sort of black surface layer. Some of them are able to cut in such a way that you, you have a more matte um, surface finish that's mm. not black in appearance. Um, okay, and then um, some, just about uh, the gemstone cutting of diamonds. Um, how much loss on average do we have when you have go from a rough stone to a polished stone? So maybe if we just take the ideal example of a diamond octahedron and you're cutting two round brilliance from it, how much loss on average would you have um, for that situation or that scenario? Yeah, I, I, I'm not really sure off the top of my head what the, the typical loss of material is. I, I think, um, you know, if you cut a rough diamond and got a yield of 70% of and you lost, you know, 30% of the diamond, I mean, I would guess that that's a pretty good yield, but I'm not really sure uh, what a, uh, a yield you would expect for, for instance, for an octahedron where you saw it in two and then cut two round brilliance from it. I mean, the yield there would be good, but what exactly a good yield is, I'm not 100% sure. Um, okay, well, um, thank you very much, Evan. That was a very entertaining talk. Um, I've certainly never burnt my fingers while polishing diamonds.
wink. Um, <laughs> so um, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you for joining us. And we hope that you will join us again next week. Um, our other colleague, Dr. Mike Breeding, is going to be talking about lab-grown diamonds and how the evaluation of these diamonds have evolved um, at GIA. Also, uh, please follow GIA on all the social media channels. Um, we have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, and we hope to see you again soon. Bye -bye. Thank you.